go. gender identity, and or abilities. Whether you're here with us in person or you are joining us virtually, we know that love knows no boundaries and that we are one in spirit. As a purpose-driven church, Unity of Monterey Bay is an inclusive spiritual community committed to co-creating an environmentally sustainable, spiritually fulfilling, socially just and compassionate human presence on the planet. We celebrate our oneness and we honor the God of each of our understanding, affirming the innate good and divine essence within each and every individual. Will you please join me now in our statement of faith? There is only one presence and one power in the universe, God the good, expressing as infinite God beyond us, intimate God beside us, inner God being us, divine love in action. And so it is. We continue to pray for peace, holding a vision in which every person is valued in a world that works for all. To be the peace we want to see in the world, we do not turn away from the pain and suffering of war, but allow our hearts to be broken open and filled with compassion. And seeking to strengthen our conviction, we imagine ourselves in a room filled with people from all over the world, many who represent cultures or traditions very different from our own, including some our nation is currently in conflict with, 
And still, we affirm together. Now, I'm going to need your help because I don't remember all the hand motions. <laughs> Can we say it together and you guys kind of do it with me? Oh, I can't see. I offer you peace. I offer you love. I offer you friendship. I see your beauty. I hear your need. I feel your feelings. My wisdom flows from the highest source. I salute that source in you. Let us work together in unity and love. Awesome. Amen and amen. May it be so. And from this prayer for peace, we also celebrate our children who apparently don't come up here anymore. <laughs> <I know. laughs> They're getting all grown up, aren't they? But we just hold in our hearts all the children, those in our community, in our families, and all the children around the world, holding them in our hearts and seeing them protected and resilient, creative and evolving, joyous and loved. So please join me in our heartfelt blessing. We love, we love you. you. We, we bless, bless you. you. We, we appreciate, appreciate you just the way you are. This bright light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This bright light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This bright light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. So before we move on, I want to take some time to honor the lives that were lost in Uvalde this past week. And as a minister preparing for a Sunday after an event like this happens, it can be really hard to know what to say. Seems like we've already said everything that needs to be said, and we keep saying it over and over. And so what I did was I found a video, and John, you can try going to the next slide and let's see if it works. The Association for Global New Thought, which um, Unity is a member of, created a prayer, a video of prayer. Okay, so we're going to watch this. It's not coming through the... Can, John, can you stop it for a second? Is there something that needs to be plugged in so that it comes through the... I mean, she hasn't even really started. You could just pause it. Mine? Oh, it was hard for me to get this thing on in the first place. Do you know which one it is? The one that says computer. In the meantime, is this Romeo's debut here, Martha? Or is he an old timer by now? Oh, okay, well, we do have a new dog in residence. And he's so well behaved. You can that these instances have created. As we release Let Go and Let God, we recognize that God's strength, God's grace, God's peace, God's understanding rests with each one of these families. We bless these souls as they enter into their new experience in the presence of God. And we know that without a shadow of a doubt, God's everlasting love rests with them and us. We thank you, God, for the wisdom to take whatever actions necessary that we need to do to take care of each other, to love each other, to protect each other, and to go forward in peace, love, and dignity. 
We thank you, God, for the marvelous opportunity to hold the high watch, knowing that as we lift ourselves up in consciousness, we bless, we heal, and we strengthen all who are open and receptive to the healing love of the Holy Spirit that resides within each human being. And so it is. And I know that as we speak right now, this trauma, this pain that goes from various communities, from Buffalo to, to Texas to different areas, I speak this word knowing that there is this healing power of love, the healing power of spirit that right now is moving so that there be love and comfort and healing to every family, every person, every community that's involved, even our entire nation that right now feels this. But I know that this love is healing. And I also speak this word for change. Something that changes, that brings about action from leadership in this country, whatever is needed, I know that it's time now for there to be peace. Peace and love where there seems to be all of the anger. I speak a word now that brings peace and love and healing for our communities and for our nation. As I say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. So it is. And tuning in and connecting in the oneness into that divine light of spirit, the light that blesses each one of us, that is the truth of each one of us, the light that guides us to move forward in our own lives, individually and collectively. I know the higher truth as we rise up from all these conditions is peace, the peace that passes all understanding. The truth is love, this transcendent love that connects each one of our hearts and our lives and our consciousness. I know the truth is that each one of us is divinely guided as what is ours to do to move forward, to lift up ourselves individually and as our world collectively to truly reveal the truth of peace, peace on earth right here and right now. And I pass my word. And I know that this one divine presence that is here revealing itself in, as, and through everything is love, is this peace, is this harmony. And I know that as those that are suffering right now from actions that may not come from the human knowing of love. I know that they too are held in the infinite, that they are held as the light of love. And I see that as we each say yes to being a greater vessel individually and collectively, to standing up for what we know needs to be done, the action taken in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives, that there is a healing. There is a healing that is happening right now. And I am grateful for this. And I pass this prayer on. And so I speak a word and claim for each one that is touched by the vibration being created here, that is touched by the revelation of truth, of healing that is happening here, that collectively we are creating a world that works for all, that collectively each one adding a piece of the consciousness, adding a piece of the vibration to say that this, it, this these horrible events are now in our history, are now in our past, and we move forward in a healing, in an uplifting, in a vision a vision of a world free from gun-based violence, a vision of a world where every life matters, where every life is uplifted and inspired, where each and every child is has that opportunity for a safe education, for a safe experience of life. I know this word is already being acted upon them by that universal law, and so I pass my word along. And in this atmosphere, this prayerful atmosphere, I take the time to acknowledge what so many people feel. Fatigue from ongoing tragedy, 
fatigue from having to repeatedly offer condolences, fatigue from having to reframe and discover perspectives that are spiritual. And in this prayerful atmosphere, I remind myself how important it is not to forget to stay awake, not to forget the power of common decency and not to become numb and to remember in the words of Howard Thurman to keep fresh before me the moments of my high resolve and not go to sleep. And so in this prayer, I plant the thought to take time today and the days to come to allow the immensity of the tragedy to be felt and to be experienced and then in the silence of my own heart to awaken to that which is mine to do and to trust that wisdom within to guide and to inspire and to lead and I pass my word when we recognize the wholeness, we are but one family, and our natural state is wholeness. Although we recognize anomalies that drag us away from center, drag us away from our wholeness, we know that as a void empties, it wants to be filled, it wants to be brought back to center, it wants to be made whole once again. And we simply have to allow this spirit to flow in and through each and every one of us to bring us back to this center of wholeness, as it is our natural state. We do not let the anomalies drag us off into anger and frustration and rage and revenge. We stay rooted in the center of love and kindness, knowing that we are in fact one family. And as one family, we will find the highest and best solutions to these issues, bringing us back to the center of wholeness. And we are grateful for the presence of God outside, beside and inside as us helping to bring about this wholeness, and I am complete. If you could just go back to the slide with the photos for just a moment. So I'd like to also share with you this morning uh, this poem by young woman who's quickly becoming our country's poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, called Hymn for the Hurting. Everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange, minds made muddied and mute. We carry tragedy, terrifying and true, and yet none of it is new. We knew it as home, as horror, as heritage. Even our children cannot be children, cannot be. Everything hurts. It's a hard time to be alive, and even harder to stay that way. We're burdened to live out these days while at the same time blessed to outlive them. This alarm is how we know we must be altered, that we must differ or die, that we must triumph or try. Thus, while hate cannot be terminated, it can be transformed into a love that lets us live. May we not just grieve, but give. May we not just ache, but act. May our signed right to bear arms never blind our sight from shared harm. May we choose our children over chaos. May another innocent never be lost. Maybe everything hurts, our hearts shadowed and strange, but only when everything hurts. May everything change. And so we give thanks for the wisdom of these words from this young woman. And we hold these prayers that we've just heard in our hearts and do just what one of them said, continue to return over and over to the silence of our own hearts where we may know what is ours to do. Thank you, God. The gong now, John. Yeah, you have to gong it first. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 
So let's, all t let's take a very necessary deep breath in and let it out with an audible sigh. As we center ourselves to embrace this blissful interconnection with spirit, and we invite the chime to call us into the sacred space within. We ring the chime four times to call in the four directions and to remind us of our interconnection with all of creation and with the sacred circle of life. As we feel it resonate through our very beings, we follow its call into this now present moment within. Continuing to focus on our breath, with each inhale we open our hearts and minds. We envision our breath reaching every cell of our being. And with each exhale, we see all barriers and obstacles dissolving into the divine flow. And again, as we inhale, we expand the spaciousness within us. We move beyond the limitations and boundaries of our bodies. And as we exhale, we ground ourselves deep within Mother Earth and into our oneness with the universe. Finally, we breathe our awareness into the highest expression of love, light, joy, and peace we can imagine as we experience a transforming wave of gratitude and with a fullness of heart, we say yes to it all. Embracing, claiming, and knowing the divine Christ spirit expressing in, through, and as us. And so now with a final exhale, we say thank you, God. And now fully centered and transformed by the power of spirit, we enter into our lesson and meditation time with today's Daily Word. We read from Daily Word for today, shared with permission of Unity Publisher of Daily Word, that can also be found at dailyword.com. And the word is comfort. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. The love in my heart is my comfort. If the sadness of loss diminishes my joy as I think of happy experiences that the loved ones who are no longer with me, I remember that the love we shared will bind us together always. Love can never die. Love, the most beautiful attribute of God, is present always and everywhere. I am comforted as my heart opens to the divine love within me knowing that this same love enfolds all of those I hold dear, no matter where they are on the eternal journey of life. Peace and strength grow in my awareness as I open myself to love's expression. I bless everyone who comes to mind today with a loving thought. I speak a loving word or perform a simple act of kindness whenever I can. As I bring comfort to others, I am comforted also. And from the scriptures, let your steadfast love become my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Psalms chapter 119, verse 76. Be 
In witness to the wisdom of the many paths to the sacred, we read from four sacred traditions on this morning's topic, self-love and self-care. From Hinduism, bright but hidden, the self dwells in the heart. Everything that moves, breathes, opens and closes lives in the self, the source of love. Realize the self hidden in the heart and cut asunder the knot of ignorance here and now. From Buddhism, every being has the Buddha, Buddha nature. This is the self. From Judaism, let a man always consider himself as if the Holy One dwells within him. And from Christianity, do you know, not know that you are God's temple? and that God's spirit dwells in you? For God's temple in, is holy, and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Blessings abound in this moment, silent and open listening. Spirit, I feel a blessed unfoldment, breathing new life in me. In this moment, truth and clarity find their way to me. In this moment, I'm where I should be, safe in the arms of love. Blessings abound in this moment, silent and open listening. Spirit, I feel a blessed unfoldment, breathing new life in me. In this moment, truth and clarity find their way to me. In this moment, I'm where I should be, safe in the arms of love. I'll trust myself, I'll seize this day, I know my heart will lead the way. I'll trust myself, I'll seize this day, I know my heart will lead the way. I'll trust myself, I'll seize this day, I know my heart 
will lead the way. I'll trust myself. I'll seize this day. I know my heart will lead the way. In this moment, truth and clarity find their way to me. In this moment, I'm where I should be, safe in the arms of love. Ooh, in this moment. In this moment, in this moment, mm. Thank you, John. <laughs> well, you may have noticed that I wasn't here last Sunday. At least I hope you noticed. <laughs> so I decided I want to share with you all today what, where I was and what I was doing. I was resting. right? And I'm not talking about napping, although I am a world-class napper, like Jesus, right? Jesus took naps. Remember the boat? Wake up, Savior. So I was resting. I went to a little Airbnb, which is, <laughs> Airbnb is just the most awesome thing that ever happened. And I, I always pick ones that are near the woods. You all know I love to be near trees and out in nature. And I try to always get one that has a hot tub because I love that too. And I was just there for, you know, 36 hours or something, practicing self-love and self-care by just being just simply being and allowing my mind, body, soul, and spirit to just rest. Sounds pretty radical, right, in our culture. This is a radical thing that I did. I'm fortunate to have chosen a career that allows me to do this and actually not only allows me but actually requires that I do this in order to be a good minister. In my first year of seminary, we had um, a professor who assigned us to go and spend 24 hours in silence. And let me tell you, people were freaking out. <laughs> I decided to go down to the, I can never say this right, Camel Dolly, the, the um, monastery down in Lucia. It's about an hour south of Big Sur, where the monks are silent. <laughs> so I thought, who's going to talk to me, right? They're silent there. Let me tell you, that is a beautiful, blissful place. Has anyone ever been there? Oh, you get these austere little rooms, you know, it's just like a bed and then a desk, but every room has a view of the ocean. It's stunning. So except for going to Vespers to hear the monks sing, which is also really beautiful, I kept silence for 24 hours. Hard to believe, right? <laughs> I can do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, it was pretty awesome. The thing that was hard was we were not allowed to use our cell phones or bring a book or knitting or coloring or anything. We were supposed to do nothing. So nothing was wonderful at first, right? I prayed, I meditated, I took a little walk, I sat and looked at the ocean, and I prayed again, meditated again, took another little walk, and it was still only like 6 p.m. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, it's going to be a long night. Because I'm a night owl. I, I rarely go to sleep before like 1. 
I sat there staring at the wall watching a spider crawl down. And I tried really hard to do nothing. I did do nothing for a whole bunch of hours, but then I hit a wall and I just couldn't do nothing anymore. I went rummaging through the drawers to find some reading material. (laughs) The only thing I could find was the Bible. (laughs) So I sat down and darned if I didn't read the whole book of Mark from start to finish. That was my failure. Well, it wasn't a failure because it was still an awesome, and I did keep the silence. But my point is that this is not something we're comfortable with doing in our culture, just being, just sitting, just being quiet. And it's my personal belief that we all need to do a lot more of it. The fact that it makes us so uncomfortable means we need to do it more. And I believe that we can cultivate the ability to do this. Right to just sit and be and do nothing and allow our, bi- our bodies and minds to rest. And when we do this, we learn a lot about ourselves. We were told over and over in seminary how important it was for us to practice self-care as ministers. There's a very high burnout rate in ministry. And so we were told that we needed to take those types of silent retreats or personal retreats you know, a few times a year. I haven't always done that. Um, I do do it a a couple times a year. I'm going to be doing it more because I'm going to be really upping my self-care and I invite you along with me. It's important for a minister, it's important for everyone, but it's especially important for a minister to spend time maintaining their own personal health and spiritual state of mind and everything because I can't give from an empty cup. I can't give from something that I don't have. I can't get up here and have anything to share with you if I am not practicing it out there myself, regularly going and filling myself up so that I have something to bring here and share with you. So that's a big part of self-care. But self-care is also the things that we do every day. And for me, that's exercise, eating healthy, you know, uh, taking time to read, to meditate, pray, getting regular therapy, getting regular body work. These are all things that I do to care for myself. Now, in addition to being a minister, I think most of you know that I have a delightful but demanding 22-year-old special needs son. And despite the fact, some of you may remember, there was a point in time when they told us Alexander might never speak. He did, in fact, learn to speak, and he has not stopped since. I probably hear mommy, 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 ma, mama, ma, (laughs) about 800 times a day. Alexander is absolutely the light of my life, and he is a delight, but if I did not take some time away, I would lose my ever-loving mind. Now, these are my particular life circumstances of being a minister and being a special needs mom, but I'm no different than all of you. We all have those particular circumstances in our own lives that create stress, and so This regular self-care and self-love is so important for all of us. In fact, it's survival. The feminist author and activist Audre Lorde, she said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. So this is important stuff. As I was researching this sermon, I came across a lot of so-called warnings about this whole thing about self-care. Most of them were from ultra-religious folks. The dangers of prioritizing self-care. Can you imagine the kind of things they were saying? Self-care is too self-centered. It's too self-indulgent. It will lead us to be selfish and to have a lack of concern for others. According to that perspective, we should always place others above ourselves at all times. Now, I kind of understand the sentiment because we absolutely do need to spend a significant amount of our time caring about and caring for others, especially those that Jesus called the least of these, those on the margins of society who need extra consideration, 
the poor, the disenfranchised, the sick, the prisoner, the widow. But self-love is not about pride or ego, and practicing self-care does not make us self-centered or selfish. In fact, if you recall, when Jesus was asked by his disciples what the most important of all the commandments was, he said that we were to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and we were to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love our neighbor as ourselves. So this verse, is urg- this verse is urging us to love ourselves in the same way that we love our neighbor. In a balanced way. If we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor, then we will be selfish and self-centered, right? On the other hand, if we love our neighbor more than we love ourselves, then we will be self-negligent. We won't care for ourselves. We won't set good boundaries. So putting others first, that that, you you should always put others above yourself, that may sound like selfishness, I'm sorry, selflessness. That might sound like selflessness at first. But if we don't care for ourselves, we will eventually burn out and have nothing left to give. So we don't put our neighbor before ourselves, and we don't love ourselves more than our neighbor. We do both in a balanced, equal way, and I believe that's what Jesus meant with that statement. Loving ourselves and caring for ourselves keeps us healthy, keeps us shored up, and loving others keeps us from being too self-focused. Now, I mentioned we cannot give from an empty cup. We cannot give from an empty reservoir. This, if we do this for too long, it will create emotional exhaustion and burnout, not just ministers, everybody. And we can't give to others what we don't have ourselves, right? Loving ourselves and giving ourselves that care and that compassion builds up a reservoir of love within us that we can then draw from and lavish upon others. Do you see how we love our, our neighbor as ourselves? The author Eleanor Brown said it like this, rest and self-care are so important. When you take time to replenish your spirit, it allows you to serve others from the overflow. You cannot serve from an empty vessel. So as I was preparing this talk, I was asking myself whether what I really wanted to talk about was self-care or self-love. And then I realized that they are really, you know, inextricably intertwined. They cannot be separated. We practice self-care because we love ourselves. And by loving ourselves through these self-care practices, we expand and strengthen that love for ourselves. But if we overextend ourselves, we will eventually be empty and have nothing to give. So we keep our own cup full with self-love and self-care practices so that we can then love and care for others. Now, how do we love ourselves? I've talked a little bit about different types of self-care. And in the media, you hear a lot of self-care, like as if self-care was about, you know, lighting a candle and throwing a bath bomb in the in the bathtub, right? And that's okay, you can do that. Those are good, helpful things. But that doesn't go far enough. (laughs) That's a sort of surface level of self-care. That's wonderful, but it's not enough. In addition to things like eating healthy food and getting plenty of sleep and moving our bodies in healthy ways, we also need to spend time cultivating a deep inner compassion for ourselves and learning to treat ourselves with great kindness. This is a journey that I've been on particularly for the last few years. And I believe it's really how we heal whatever wounding we have. It's how we discover and work to change those negative beliefs about ourselves. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. It will never be enough. Yada, yada. Insert your own personal inner critic phrase, right? 
It's how we find and root out those self-defeating behaviors that are a result of us not loving ourselves and not having compassion for ourselves. I love it. Brene Brown says that we should talk to ourselves the same way we would talk to someone we love. Can you imagine doing that? Like your best friend, when they're hurting, how would you talk to them? Lovingly and patiently and with kindness. We need to learn to give that to ourselves, to talk to ourselves in our moments of meditation and prayer, to talk to ourselves with that same loving kindness. Self-love must also ex involve accepting ourselves just as we are. Now, this is a journey. You don't just get there. This is something we, we, we strive towards. Self-love also involves allowing, us to have, allowing ourselves to have our feelings, whatever they are. Giving ourselves to the space to feel whatever we're feeling and whatever we need to feel. Listening to ourselves and trusting our own intuition and our own inner guidance. These are ways of loving ourselves. Setting boundaries. Learning to say no when it's appropriate protecting ourselves from people who are abusive or toxic. So these are all ways that we can practice self-care and self-love. And you probably have your own ways of what, what is best for you. But I want to talk a little bit about something I mentioned at the beginning. It's not, some, it's not an aspect of self-care that people talk about very much, and I'm talking about rest. Rest is so taboo in this culture. It's like, what are you doing? You should be being productive. What did you do during, remember the pandemic? You were supposed to have made a sourdough starter and learned Russian and come on people, you know? <laughs> what happened to rest? Our culture doesn't allow that because we are obsessed with productivity. And of course, I'm not talking about more sleep, although sleep is important. I'm talking about a different type of rest. Let me describe to you what I mean. When I was on retreat, um, I stayed in a little cabin out in Kachagua. And there wasn't much out there. My first time out in Kachagua, there ain't nothing out there, is there? Oh, so stunningly beautiful. There wasn't anything to do, and that's exactly what I wanted. And so, you know, and for me, being in nature is really like the, the best possible thing. And, the, and it's so important to my self-care to spend as much time in nature as possible. And thank God we live where we do. I'm able to do that frequently. I believe nature heals us. And I believe that nature connects us to our true nature. And I believe that nature gives us deep rest. You all know I'm obsessed with redwood trees. You don't see them running around trying to get a bunch of stuff done. They're busy just being. And look at them standing for thousands of years, right? So I was out in this cabin in Kachagua, and I, there was a little wooden footbridge that crossed this uh, dry creek bread, bed. And I said to myself, I want to go and sit on that little bridge. I don't know why, I just wanted to. And I went and sat there in the middle. There were birds, I mean, just a gazillion birds. They were all singing. It was amazing. Um, it was warm. It's just oak trees and, um, you know, rolling hills. The lupin was growing. It was stunning. And so I sat there on the bridge, my legs dangling down like a little girl, <laughs> and my trusty canine companion, Winnie, at my side. Winnie's like, is this what we're doing, Mom? Okay. Dogs are great for that, right? So everything was green from, you know, being spring, and it was just, I just sat there doing nothing. And I said, this kind of feels good. You know, this feels good sitting here doing nothing. I think I'll do it for about three more hours. <laughs> and I did. Just sitting there observing, listening to the birds, and uh, a little woodpecker was just banging his little head against the tree, you know, and I was just like, oh, isn't that interesting? Just observing. Until I got uncomfortable. And without even meaning to, I kept noticing that I kept taking myself out of that present moment. You know, I'd just be in that moment of bliss. Oh, it's just so wonderful. And then all of a sudden, I'm pulling out my phone. Why didn't I leave the phone in the cabin? You know, I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> but suddenly, I'm reaching for my cell phone to check if someone liked my last post on Facebook. 
you know, to see if, uh, you know, to look something up that just, oh, you know, how are woodpeckers skulls made? <laughs> you know, stuff like this that pops into my brain and I have to look it up to check whether my husband or my son had contacted me. So this was interesting information for me, and I didn't shame myself, I just noticed it. I noticed my own reluctance to be in the now as I was just sitting there on that little bridge. The way my mind kept taking me out of the present moment experience, the experience I was having, and my mind would start going on to what am I going to do next? You know, when I go back inside the cabin, I'm going to make myself a coffee. Like, I just couldn't stay in the present moment. What am I going to do later? What am I going to do tomorrow? It just kept going and going. At one point after I'd been sitting there for a particularly long time, I suddenly got this urge to go on Amazon and buy something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, there ain't nothing that I need in that moment. But I'm thinking, what can I buy? What can I buy? So again, you know, I didn't shame myself for this, but this is interesting information for me to learn about myself. And so it became a practice of discipline of bringing myself back over and over to the present moment, to that feeling of my legs swinging on the bridge, to those little woodpeckers just going to town, and my dog breathing, panting next to me. And I vowed in that moment to do this practice more often. And I want to do this to keep myself healthy, but I also want to model it for all of you. I want you to do more of this also. Where's my rest of my sermon? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Hold on a minute. What in the heck? Okay, rest and be in the present moment for just a second while I find page nine. Oh, my goodness. Well, we may not have a page nine. Are you resting? Are you thinking about the present moment? Okay. <laughs> so this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in my, I'm about to have three years since my ordination and I'm finding my voice and I, I know, right? I know, how did that happen? Um, and I, I'm finding what are my, my messages, the messages that really emerge from my heart, and I'm finding that this thing about rest is really one of them. I hope that it will be helpful to you guys <laughs> because I want to give you permission to do it. You know, you could say, my minister told me I had to rest. That's why I'm sitting here looking at the ocean, listening to the seals. She told me. So I also... Uh, remembered something that we learned in seminary about left and right brain. I'm not going to totally go into it, but basically, you know, the left brain is the analytical, linear, you know, um, orderly, and this is a gross generalization, but way of thinking. And the right brain is the more holistic, more conceptual, more um, the part responsible for more creativity and things like that in most people, not always. What I, what, what I remember learning in seminary is that as a culture, we are an overly left brain dominated people. Our whole culture is left brain, you know, logical, analytical, orderly. And so this actually puts us out of balance. And so we need to bring back in, we need to bring our right brain back on board you know, bring it back online, because that actually does create more harmony in the way the hemispheres of our brain work together, and it can bring us more calm. So, you know, things that, things that use the right brain, coloring, painting, you know, walking and observing nature, um, you know, whatever it is for you, those things can help bring our brains back into better balance. These are ways that we can practice self-care and self-love that will bring great benefits to our minds, bodies, and spirits because we live in a technology-addicted culture and it's hard on our bodies. We are overstimulated. That was me, like, couldn't just sit there because I, I wanted to look something up, you know? That's that, that technology, like, interfering in my ability to just be a human being. And it doesn't have to be a whole weekend away, although that's wonderful. But not everyone can do that. I had to make a lot of arrangements just to make that happen for myself. But, but what we need to do is build these 
periods of rest into our daily lives. 15 minutes here, an hour there, an afternoon. You know, starting, if possible, a Sabbath practice where you take a whole day of rest. I'm still, I preached about that, what, a year ago? I'm still working on doing that. Um, but even if it can't be a whole day, building that more into our lives. And so I want to invite you to try that. You know, try taking some time this next week to just rest. And you can report back and tell me about it. I'd love to hear about it. But what I want to let you know is that when that happens to you, and you, you know, if that happens to you, that you get uncomfortable and you find that it's hard for you to just sit still, don't shame yourself. You know, that's just, that's just a function of our culture and our society. And um, again, that self-love is just letting those feelings be. Just notice them. Just go, wow, isn't that interesting? I want to buy something on Amazon. I wonder what that's about, you know? And just practice that resting. And, 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 and when you find yourself being pulled away from the present moment, you know, this is like meditation, and we practice it in our formal meditation time, that coming back to the present moment. But this is sort of practicing it in our lives, like bringing it out of just our meditation time and practicing it in our lives. Every time we notice that we're off, we're not experiencing the moment. You know, the big one for me, I want to take a picture of the moment and post it to show everybody else the moment <laughs> before even experiencing the moment myself. The Facebook generation, what can I tell you? So with all of the tragedies and the things that have been going on in our world lately, this self-love and this self-care is more important than ever. I want to urge you really to think about this and to try to build these things into your lives. Ultimately, we all want to be kind, loving people who give of ourselves in service to others, right? But in order to do this, we've got to love ourselves and give ourselves regular time of rest so that we can keep our own cups full. Think of your cup. You know, how full is it today? Am I down to the bottom or am I overflowing? Because it is from the overflow of love and compassion that we have lavished upon ourselves that we can then give to others. Rumi said, Never give from the depths of your well, but from your overflow. I thought that was really interesting. Never give from the depths of your well, but from your overflow. So we've got to be constantly creating that overflow for ourselves in order to keep our own cups overflowing. And no one else is going to do this for us. That's the thing. We have to do it for ourselves. It's not anyone else's job. It is our job to care for ourselves so that we can truly follow that commandment that Jesus gave us, right? To love our neighbor as ourselves. Rest in God, God rests in me. I rest in comfort and release. I rest in God, God rests in me. I rest in comfort.
If you haven't already done so, I invite you to close your eyes and just prepare for just a few moments of resting in this present moment. As we just allow the words of that song to be true for us, I rest in God. God rests in me. This is where we find our comfort. This is how we practice that self-care and that self-love. Spending just a few moments each day allowing our minds to quiet, our bodies to be still. Finding that sense of stillness within us. Finding that sense of peace that lives at the core of our being. Breathing in deeply, nourishing our bodies with air, and breathing out, relaxing, and letting go. All you have to do for the next few moments is gently breathe in and breathe out. Allowing the breath to be gentle, allowing it to come to you on its own. Allowing the breath to breathe you. And bring your attention now to your heart space. And just notice what's there this morning. You may be feeling pain or fear anger, frustration, or maybe you are feeling peace, joy, happiness, love, whatever's there, just allow it to be there. This is one way we love ourselves, by making room for whatever is there. If there are difficult feelings, we can say to ourselves, it's okay to feel this. Everyone feels like this at times. Let everything belong. Let no part be left out. Find a sense of compassion for yourself for this tender heart and for whatever is in that heart this morning. As you rest for a few moments in the silence. opportunity that we have had to remember rest, 
to remember our own tender hearts and to give ourselves that love and compassion so that our own cups may be filled to overflowing. And in deep gratitude, we say, thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. Unity of Monterey Bay is the collective consciousness and commitment of all of us who give of our time, treasure, and talent in order to sustain this spiritual community that is dedicated to transforming lives. We know that prosperity is a state of mind that finds blessings in every situation and abundance in joyous generosity. We transform all appearance or fear or lack into a faith-filled peace of mind by shifting our attention to thoughts of gratitude for the abundance of God's good in our lives. And with our hearts and minds overflowing with gratitude, we breathe into the divine flow of God's good, trusting that we are enough, that we have enough, and that there always is enough to both have and to share. And again, we are grateful to all of you for your online giving through our website at unityofmontereybay.org and through your mailed-in offerings, including those who have set up automatic giving with your banking institutions. We are truly blessed. For those of you here in person, the baskets are in the back by the aisle and by the door, or if you prefer, you can use a credit card in the sacred grounds after the service. And you can drop your offering off on your way out this morning. And now, from this place of faith and gratitude, I invite you to join me in mindful intention and joining in our offertory blessing. I am an open channel for God's infinite good. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies everything I give and everything I receive. I am both blessed and a blessing. Thank you, God. Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest. Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and stay. give thanks this morning to the musicians whose music we used, William Steffi and Henry Victor Morgan, Denise Rosier, Richard Burdick, and Ricky Byers Beckwith for their amazing, inspiring music, and our music team, and Denise and John back there, and Robin, and, and Michelle, and me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for announcements, check your e-blast. And note that there is um, a Wednesday night class coming up and that our banquet is coming up in September. So just check those things in your e-blast. And Robin has a quick announcement about the stand down. So I'm not sure if you all have seen. Uh, local stations are putting a blast out for us. We are doing a stand down this year, June 17th and 18th. We will not be housing our veterans overnight, unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions. 
but we are going to have legal services, SPCA, I'm doing clothing again. We have Meals on Wheels there. We will have uh, one of the um, VA medical, we have dental, we have vision, we have all kinds of things going on. If you would like to join us, and I would strongly urge it, please, uh, Martha's going to be putting a copy of this flyer on our Unity website. And it's, you can go to the VTC, Veterans Transition Center website, click on current events, and there will be a link for the stand down. We ask everyone, because of the COVID challenges and everything right now, that we need to put in some personal information before we put in for our volunteer hours. Uh, that way, just in case, if we need to do any contact tracing, we know when you were there, where you were at, in which area. Uh, we are going to urge masks, of course, but um, it's our way. We've got to help our homeless veterans. You know, there should never be a homeless veteran, ever. Um, one uh, change this year is the legal services. We will have lawyers and uh, judges on Saturday. Is open to all veterans, not just our homeless. The other services are for our, our homeless vets, but legal services will be open to all veterans. Must re re register ahead of time so that they have the pertinent information that they'll need when uh, the vets come in for help. So if you can, please join us. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin, Thank you, Robin, for your ongoing service to our veterans. As we bring our service to a close this morning, we are so grateful that you have joined us, whether you're here in person or joining us virtually. And whether it's your first time with us or you're a regular, we hope we've made you feel at home in our Unity of Monterey Bay community. And we want you to know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. Chaplain on duty today is Robin. She's available to pray with you after the service. Mm -hmm. And there are also prayer slips in your pews. You can write your prayer request on there and put it in the little wooden box on your way out the door, and those will be prayed over by our prayer chaplains. So with all of that, let's join for our closing circle for our prayer for protection and our peace song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Linda's blouse. She's so cute. <laughs> so as we create this sacred circle this morning and prepare to say our prayer for protection, I just invite you to hold in your heart all of the families of the victims of Uvalde. Just send them love. Send them comfort. Imagine God's arms just wrapping around them and folding them. Walking through this difficult time with them so that they know that they're not alone. And may we vow here to do everything we can to make sure that this never happens again. Please join me in our prayer for protection. The light, light of, of God, God surrounds, surrounds us. I am light. The love, love of God, God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well.
this be the moment.